No one can predict the future, mm. but we can learn skills to anticipate okay. change better. ChatGPT is probably like you were at university. Okay. ChatGPT is a good second year student. They think it, they know everything. Yes. They're learning how to communicate it. Actually, they know very mm. little. So I'm excited to see AI adding to the clever professions we've got okay. in the world. Making doctors better at what mm. they do, making engineers smarter, yeah. uh, making designers more creative. Yeah. So I'm less worried about being replaced and more excited. Let's call it not AI, let's call it IA. Okay. To have an intelligent assistant. Okay. People need to realize, yes, that's a fact. Culture is important and we must be careful of losing our culture. Mm. At the same time, culture always changes. Yeah. And that's that is the true. exciting thing about a culture. Yeah. Don't hold back, say it loud. Artificial intelligence. You know, more than a decade ago, I was in university and I was writing a paper on artificial intelligence, but it was more on, you know, the developed countries such as the US and the UK, and never in my wildest dream did I think it was going to be applicable to South Africa. This morning, I was going through, you know, for breakfast in one of the fast food uh, franchises industries, and I was very surprised uh, because I was more used to, you know, going into the counter, speaking to someone, ordering what I wanted no 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 with this one you order yourself by you know uh, using a particular screen and then you just go and fetch your order and that's when I started thinking about actually now this is in South Africa today we are welcoming Graham Codrington and um, he's a global speaker and author and also a futurist now I went to Google what a futurist is um, Graham and basically I feel like it is a white sangoma <laughs> <laughs> is that true, Graham? Welcome to the show. Let's first oh, start from you, there. Rosie. Thank you. you. You know what? It would be wonderful okay. if I had the ability to be able to predict the future. But let's be honest. If I could predict the future, I wouldn't be here. Okay. Uh, all due respect, yes. I wouldn't be anywhere. Okay. I, I would own uh, a country somewhere. So um, tell no me, one, what is a futurist? Yeah, no one can predict the future, mm. but we can learn skills to anticipate okay. change better. Okay. So my company name is Tomorrow Today, and that explains it. Mm. I spend half my time in tomorrow mm -hmm. trying to identify what forces might shape the world okay. and looking for scenarios. So it's not trying to predict, but it's trying to say what would happen if. Okay. Maybe best case, maybe worst case, see what happens. The other half of my time is spent in today's world, okay. trying to help people prepare for whatever might happen, mm. be more adaptable, be open. Uh, to change. And, and what sort of uh, tools do you use, um, you know, Graham, in terms of doing that? Um, others, for example, in the economy world, um, as an economist, you look at trends, you know, mm. what was happening 10 years ago, um, what could potentially happen in the next 10 years. So with you in particular, what, ty what type of tools do you use? So there are different types of futurists. Some are specialists in certain industries. So they might have a, a qualification or a background in medicine or transportation okay. or politics. Uh, most futurists, though, tend to be more generalists. Mm. So you're trying to do all of those things. So you're trying to look at all the different trends. You're looking at politics and economics and industry and so on. And then you're also looking at how people respond to that. So you want a little bit maybe of sociology and psychology. Mm -hmm. So for me, the exciting part and the, the reason I shifted my career, I started life as an accountant. I wasn't okay. a very good one, but oh. I did. I did <laughs> start. Thank you for your honesty. No, my, my <laughs> it wasn't because I couldn't do it. I just didn't like it. Okay. But I, but I got the understanding of business and the understanding of people, the mm. understanding of technology. And I saw where all of those things came together sure. and then my interest in trying to understand the future and how the world was changing okay. and and so yeah all of those came together for me and it's really about for me my focus is on the future of work mm. trying to understand how does technology how does uh, the world of work sure. how do people all change and how will that give us a new way of working sure, in the future? Sure. Now, when I was doing my introduction, I was telling you about the paper that I wrote mm. on artificial intelligence. And I mean, this was 10 years back. And I thought to myself, um, you know, as my lecture was, you know, busy discussing all of this, it's going to come to South Africa. I was like, there's no ways. Um, because of, you know, so many dynamics, it's going to cause job losses and all of that. But let's start from w with this. What is artificial intelligence and wh what is it not? 
Sure. I, and it, it's fascinating that you did a paper on artificial intelligence because there are very few places in the world, actually, mm. that have proper artificial intelligence. Mm. So it's more a concept at the moment. It's more a dream of what we think might happen okay. in, in the future. What we have at the moment, and I think probably most people think of ChatGPT maybe okay. these days as artificial intelligence, okay. which isn't really artificial intelligence. ChatGPT is probably like you were at university. Okay. ChatGPT is a good second year student. They think it, they know everything. Yes. They're learning how to communicate it. Actually, they know very mm. little. And what ChatGPT is trying to do is not trying to tell you the truth or give you facts. Mm -hmm. It's trying to answer your question and sound as intelligent okay. as it can. But if it doesn't know something, it'll just make it up. Okay. And so it's not really artificial intelligence. I think we're probably 15 or 20 years away from real artificial okay. intelligence where a machine can look at a whole lot of data, okay. analyze that data, mm -hmm. make sense of that data, mm -hmm. and then make a decision based on that analysis. Mm -hmm. Right now you still have to have a human being in the system. Mm -hmm. Our systems, our applications are very good at taking data and analyzing it. Mm -hmm. But if the data is not good, if the data's got problems in it, mm. the machine can't work that out. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, a lot of artificial intelligence, a lot of chat GPT answers these days mm -hmm. get quite racist mm. and quite sort of patriarchal quite quickly. Why? Mm. Because the database they've got is the last 50 years of the internet and books mm. and magazines and articles. That's where it's getting its so-called intelligence mm -hmm, from. Mm -hmm. But of course, if the last 50 years includes apartheid and racism and patriarchy, okay. it's going to reflect that. Mm. So somebody asked uh, Mid Journey, the, the image generator, to create different looking Barbies from every country. Okay. It made all the African and Central American Barbies very light skinned mm. uh, because it was looking what is the best looking woman in each country. And okay. it, why did it choose that? Because that's the view maybe we had 20 years ago, 30 Correct. years ago. Um, uh, a lot of the African Barbies had guns in their hands. Mm. This is an image generator mm. coming up with quite racist images. Mm. Now, do you blame the system or do you blame the fact that it's been trained mm. on our history? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not really intelligence. It's mm. taking what we already know trying to put it in a way that sounds good. Okay. So right now, I think it will take some jobs. It, it, it will take some of those entry-level jobs, as you were saying. Yes. If there's somebody who's just sitting there saying, what would you like to eat? And there's only 20 things you could say, mm -hmm. that person could be replaced. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's going to replace any environment where people need to be making decisions okay. based on the data. But, but Grandma, I'm, I'm interested, what is the biggest drive into artificial intelligence? Um, or, or, yeah, what, what's just that biggest drive that we need to now shift into that? Yeah. I think that the early drive mm. is to try and replace people. And that's, I, I think that's a problem. Mm. And I think people will discover they can't actually do Correct. it. So you, you go to whatever fast food place you got breakfast from and you order a very standard meal. Yeah. Then it's easy. Yes. Because it's, I've got 20 choices. I pick the one I want. But let's say you are allergic to tomatoes. Correct. Now, how do you tell the system mm. that? If there's a person there, you can say, please, I'm allergic to tomatoes. Make sure there's no tomatoes, yeah. no tomato sauce. If there's no way for the system mm. to do anything other than only do what it mm. was told, mm. then we're going to get into trouble quite quickly. So for mm. me, the first driver is productivity. And I think there'll be some ways in which companies use that. Mm. But most, I think a lot of people will realize quite quickly, you've still got to have a person somewhere. Right. But the real driver should be intelligence. The ah. should driver. So let's take, for example, how do we know? Let's take the food you had for breakfast. Yeah. How do we know if that's actually healthy for you or not? Mm. And how do we know how to help you live longer, but not older longer, mm. younger longer. Mm. What we would preferably like to do is get the medical information of a million people mm. who've got a very similar profile to you. Mm. Um, gender, culture, age, background, yeah. athletic ability. Now we want to look at those million 
millions of people and say, what's going to be the best diet for you to mm. eat? What's going to be the best way for you to live? What's the optimal gym routine for you to do? And now suddenly we're getting personalized medical and healthcare data just for you based on something that no human being has got access mm. to. No human being has got access to that amount of information. And no human being's got the ability to analyze that much mm -hmm. information. Yeah. So I'm excited to see AI adding to the clever professions we've got okay. in the world. Making doctors m better at mm -hmm. what they do. Making engineers smarter. Yeah. Uh, making designers more creative. Yeah. So I'm less worried about being replaced and more excited. Let's call it not AI. Let's call it IA. Okay. To have an intelligent assistant okay. to help me in whatever I'm doing. I like that. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I agree with that in terms of something that could potentially complement what is already there. Yeah. Um, I think you've answered um, the question that I'm about to ask, but I'll, I'll still ask it. Mm. Um, what are the key um, aspects of, of, of this process that we need to look into so that it complements and it continues to be a, a positive yeah. thing. Because I'll be very honest, um, for someone that is not, um, will not be able to have this uh, opportunity to speak to you, to get more information, it's all about job losses. Yeah. We cannot afford to lose jobs, especially yeah. now in, eco in our economy. So what are the key things that we need to get right and we need to make sure we, key, um, we, we, we tap into those so that it continues to grow in a positive manner? Sure. So uh, somebody watching this video, listening to the, the podcast, needs to think about maybe the job they've got or the job they, they would like to have. Mm -hmm. And they've got to think through all the different aspects of that job. Okay. And they've got to think, could, could this job be done by a machine? Mm. In other words, does it require any creative thought? Okay. Does it require me to make decisions based on information? Mm. Or am I just doing what I'm told? Mm. If you're just doing what you're told, if you're just required to do exactly the same thing every single time over and over again, mm then you need to imagine that a machine could do that job. Okay. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, but within a few years, yes. Mm. However, mm. you can look at your job or you can look at the job you'd like to have mm. and you could say, is there a place in that job where there is the need for a decision to be made mm. on the data? Mm. I'm not just doing what I'm told. I could do this, I could do that, I could do something else, and I've got to choose the best option. Mm. Well, at that point, we still need human intelligence. Mm. Mm. Even better if there's an opportunity to bring some level of creativity. Yeah. So I could do this, or I could do this, but I could do this in an interesting way. Mm. So even the person who's been replaced at your local takeout mm. place. If that person was doing it with a bit of flair, okay. was doing it, and then they got a bit of a reputation, and we know this happens. Mm. You we, can't replace that. No, you can't. We fly on the airlines, and somebody can go on, and they can do the safety briefing like they're a robot, mm. or they could do it with a bit of flair. Which yeah. do you remember? Which do you enjoy? Yeah. There, there's even the traffic cop who's standing there at the intersection when the traffic lights are out. Mm. You can just wave you through, make sure there's no accidents. Or oh, there's a bit of flair. We know mm. in, in the city I live in, Johannesburg, there's a few guys who've got a reputation. They've mm. got a bit of flair about the mm. job they do. Makes it more enjoyable for them, makes it more fun for us. And it also means a robot won't be able to replace them. Mm. And I'm giving maybe simple examples, but I think that's the mindset. Whatever job you're looking at, if you're adding in decisions and creativity, you're making sure you can't be replaced by a machine. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, Graham, a a as a futurist, um, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. What are some of the predictions have you made? And with, some, with, with those predictions, um, have you been wrong? Yes, of course. Mm. Uh, because you can't make predictions, mm. you've got to be careful. So the worst mistake I make is to try and make a prediction. Okay. What I'm trying to do is make scenarios. Okay, nice. So okay. scenarios, it, it, it's not stepping away. We're still trying to understand what might happen. Mm. But I'll give you an example. If somebody predicts, yeah, the price of oil in five years' time is going to be crazy. It's going to be $200, $500 a barrel. I can then say as a professional futurist, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Because as soon as the price of oil gets above $130 a barrel, immediately then 
alternatives become available. Mm. Shale gas becomes available. At about $110 a barrel, it becomes viable to get shale gas out mm. the ground. Now suddenly you're replacing oil. Mm. So as soon as the oil price gets too high, suddenly these alternatives mm. become available. Um, and the guys who make oil say we don't want it that high. Mm. So they start to push more oil into the market. Mm. It's a very controlled market and the price comes down again. If the price gets too low, mm. they reduce the amount of oil so it comes up. So oil sticks within a band between about 60 and $110. So I can make a very strong prediction yeah. that five years from now, oil will be about $82 a barrel. Okay. Because I know it's going to be in that band. Mm. It might be down to 70, it might be up to 90, up to 100. But I understand why oil is priced the way that it is. I understand all the systems. Mm. And so I can get a little bit more confident in helping some people relax. Mm. It's never going to go that high. And also not get too excited when it sometimes dips low. Because mm. I say within a few weeks, it will come back up again. Just an example. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to say what might happen. So let me make a prediction live now. We'll see okay. you can come back. Okay. South Africa has to have coalition government mm. in the future. We don't have a choice mm. because I think the ANC has been continually losing yeah. its majority. Correct. And I think it will continue in that. Mm. I don't think that's a, a very strong prediction in the sense that I'm saying something nobody else believes. Yeah. But then what happens? If the ANC drops below 50%, you immediately have to have a coalition. Mm. What's very unlikely to happen is one of the other parties now takes 50%. Mm. So we have to start getting ready for coalition government. Mm. We haven't been doing a very good job of it in South Africa. Mm -mm. Every time you see a coalition, mm -mm. it looks like a mess. Mm -mm. <laughs> so it's bad. Yeah. So now we need to start speaking to our politicians. We need to start speaking to businesses mm. to say, how do we get our mindset around coalition? Ish. Even better, I think. We have to start speaking to the young people, the young voters in South Africa mm. to say, do you know what? In coalition government, the most wonderful thing is every vote, in fact, does count. Because mm. mm. even if you vote for a tiny little party that's only got one person, maybe you just need that one person to join yeah. the coalition and they now start governing. Mm. One person can have a very powerful voice in a coalition democracy. Mm. But I think today's young people are Maybe they're saying, yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Mm. So I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to bother. In fact, the opposite is now becoming true. So then I turn from being a futurist maybe to an activist mm. where I'm encouraging young people, please vote. Mm. Now is your opportunity to have your voice heard. Maybe bring some young people into our parliament. That would be yeah. a freshness we need. Now, look, now that you say yeah. that, we definitely, as we're going into, you know, the elections, um, we do want to, to tap into that because young people don't want to vote. Yeah. They don't see the point in voting. Um, and, yeah, as you're saying that with the coalition government, uh, it makes sense. Yeah. It does make sense. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm not predicting who's going to win the election, what the votes will be. But what I'm trying to do is help people get a sense of what might happen in the yeah. future. And then more than even just trying to predict it, why don't we try and create it mm -hmm. as well? I, I believe that the best way to predict the future is actually to create it. I love what you said. I don't predict. I, I, I present scenarios. Yeah. I present scenarios. Um, Graham, there's a, a game um, that I want us to play very quickly. Um, so it's called Rapid Fire. Mm -hmm. um, I'm mm -hmm. going to provide you with some options and you're going to choose what's more applicable to you. Okay. Um, so you can't think. It's, it's literally within a few seconds. Okay. Two seconds. Um, first question is, what do you prefer, a dream house or a dream car? Dream house. Me too. Um, in person or virtual meetings? Virtual, actually. Me too. Uh, which game show would you want to appear on? Probably Masked Singer. Really? Yeah. Are you, can you sing? A little bit. You can hold I, a I'd, note. I'd, I'd, I'd prefer to have my, my face hidden, though. That's okay. why I'm Masked <laughs> No one, no one knows me anyway, okay. so they'd never guess. But you do realize at some point you're going to have to take off the mask. I realize, oh, but it's okay. after you've sung. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. Last question. Invention that has changed society in the last 10 years. 
you know what, I'm going to have to go back and it's not just because it's the, the t uh, content of this yeah. interview, but ChatGPT is mind blowing. Mm. It's not AI yet, but how powerful is it, even mm. though it's not AI? Mm. The ability of ChatGPT to help us present our communications in better language, if you use it for what it's meant for, it's one of the most powerful communication tools we've invented. And I think we'll look back in 10 years time and realize it was the start of something absolutely remarkable. Yeah. Now, you know, Graham, whether we like it or not, we are developing, you know. Mm. When I look um, a couple of years back, I come from a very religious family, uh, no technology used because it's frowned upon. I remember even when social media started, you know, coming up, it was very frowned upon. You can't be on social media, it's very demonic mm. uh, and all sorts of things. Then COVID happened, right? And then we saw how churches now used the same social media, the same technology that was very demonic, that was very, you know, ungodly and all of those things. They use it as a platform to reach out to people that they can reach to because no one was going to, to churches. Um, so whether we like it or not, there is going to be some level of development that we need to accept. But to what extent do we accept it? When does it become too much? It's an important question to ask as a futurist. I do quite a lot of work on the cultural side. A lot okay. of futurists ignore society mm. and culture mm. because they say, here's a technology, everybody's going to love it. Mm. You know, here's a change that's taking place in the world. We have no choices, yeah. but we do. So another example, uh, being a vegetarian is, is the better way to go. It's mm. better for the planet. It's better for our health. I still eat meat. I'm going to have to eat meat. Thank exactly. you very much. I, you know, I love the planet, but yeah. I, I need my meat. Our nyama <laughs> is it's for it's us. It's very nice. And people then must say, but now, you, now you're touching my culture. Mm. And people need to realize, yes, that's a fact. Culture is important and we must be careful of losing our culture. Mm. At the same time, culture always changes. Yeah. And that's that the true. exciting thing about a culture yeah. is it can change. And what we need to do is keep connected to the culture we've had mm. and be excited about the culture we can create. Mm. And that's what connects us with our past and our ancestors, but also then with our future and our children. Mm. And our gift to our children is, is, I think, the gift of change. Yeah. So you give them a solid basis of where we've come from, and then you give them an invitation to take their step into the future. I like that. Um, now, a part of the show uh, is to bring a snack yes. uh, that we can both share. Um, what did you bring today? And yeah, can you just uh, uh, let us know what did you bring today? I was very excited about being asked <laughs> to do this. I'll be honest. I had all sorts of choices in my mind. I decided to bring just a little bit of ice cream, which might be milkshake now. But okay. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. I hope the box has kept it safe. In a particular ice cream, though, not just any. This is Paul's ice cream okay so this was started in in Johannesburg it is in some places but it's quite special to Johannesburg and I thought I'd bring it because for me the story behind it is as interesting as the ice it's a very nice ice cream which okay we'll enjoy nice um, so very quickly and it actually comes to what we've been saying uh, so I learned about Paul's maybe 10 12 years ago where it was almost like the secret society you were told you had to be given an invitation from a friend to get on a mailing list. And oh. then sometime during a week, you were just sent a message saying, Paul's pop-up shop on Sunday, this address. And you would arrive and it was the car park, okay. literally. And they put out trestle tables. And then there's like this print, hand-printed you know, menu that Paul literally it was Paul, had spent a few weeks making a freezer full of these like weird <laughs> flavors and experimental yes. things. And then you arrive and you've just got this menu and you pick which one you want to try. And when, when he sold out, you pack everything up and you go. And it's literally in a car park. And you had to be part of this group that was told. Very exclusive. And yeah, it felt like fun and interesting and different. I'm an ice cream lover to start with. But it, for me, when you asked the question earlier about AI and everything being automated, 
I thought there's no ways you can automate polls mm. because that's how it started. Yeah. People who loved ice cream built this little vibe and society around it. And then everybody started demanding, hey, okay, we're not going to wait for once a month in a car park. <laughs> You need to start making this stuff at industrial scale yeah. so we can come and buy it yeah. and we can eat it in our own time. And I'm sad he stopped doing the pop-up stuff because he's now moved to a more serious business. But I'm also very excited yeah. that lots of people can now access Paul's ice cream because it is really good. Is it? Okay, now I, I, I yeah. want to try should, it. Should we now. do it? Should yes, do it? please. Okay. So what you'll see to start with, can we get this... Uh, on the uh, thing so they have a little bit of fun with like scoops I did it again when you open up here it says say hello to your new favorite and when we I don't know if can we finish this on the show probably not. I will not be able to finish but it at the bottom yeah. there's also a message so when you finished eating it there's going to be a message for us to to eat right oh. at the bottom and I think the last one I ate the bottom said um, eating ice cream is better than therapy. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I, think right. I agree. <laughs> I think right. So this is okay. the Rocky Road, which I quite like. It's marshmallows and chocolate and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. well, listen, I'm supposed to be on a diet. You can't be on a diet when you live near. Oh place. gosh, this is okay. I'm gonna have one more scoop. Chocolate chunks, mush, uh, you know, just marshmallow in your mouth. <laughs> How good is that? Okay, that really, that is really good. <laughs> I might I'll, let have you, to, I'll let you take that. I was just going to say, I'm going to take it off to the show, <laughs> the show. That is very interesting. I like how um, the, the story behind it and the development and, and, and how it has developed over the years. Um, as we're closing off the show, Graham, um, you made like really profound points um, for someone that is still skeptical about this whole development, it's always change, it's always development, da 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 da. What, what advice would you give that person as we're closing? I don't think anybody's actually scared of change. Mm. Uh, I'm, I guess for the next episode, you'll be wearing a different dress. Yes. Um, I can see you take uh, hair seriously. Yes. Um, you know, you're not going to eat the same food. Mm. Uh, well, maybe you do have the same food every morning if you yeah. <laughs> Maybe. But, you know, pe nobody's scared of change, actually. Mm. So you need to ask yourself, why do I tell myself I'm scared of change? Okay. And the answer is because you, it's out of your control. Mm. So we are scared when change is forced on us. Okay. We are scared when we feel we're going to lose something because of the change. Mm. How do you deal with that? You don't deal with that by trying to stop the change because that's impossible. Yeah. You deal with that by trying to understand the change mm. because you need to realize the more you understand the change, the less scary it will be. Yeah. And so for me, I maybe more than anything else as a futurist, my goal is to get people excited about the future. I like that. And to recognize, yes, it will change. That is mm. that that I can predict with certainty. Mm. Mm. The question is, are you going to let the change happen to you? Mm. And that can be scary. Mm -hmm. Or are you going to embrace the change and begin to try and influence it mm -hmm. yourself? It's not always easy to do that, but you need to try. Yeah. And if you try, hopefully you will even enjoy the attempt mm -hmm. and then it'll become less scary. Man, I like that. Understand it. How can you be part of it? How can you, infl how can you influence it? Um, because whether we like it or not, it will happen. Yeah. It will happen. So a simple example. Yes, of course. It would be ideal if you could get whatever qualifications and skills you've got, apply for a job, get a job. If that was easy, it would be wonderful. Yeah. We, we, I would love to live in a world like that. Mm. However, take Paul. Mm. He was working another job. It's an interesting story that he's got, but he just loved ice cream. Mm. So he said, I wonder if I could do something with ice cream. So he had a hobby. He made ice cream flaps. All his friends said, this stuff is amazing. So he said, well, I wonder if I make some of the stuff, if I could sell it. Mm. He then forms this little secret society of ice cream lovers. Mm. Now he's got a business empire. Maybe you don't wait for someone to give you a job. Yeah. Maybe you work out what you're really passionate about and see if you can make a job out of that. Mm. 
Hey, okay, you're talking to me now directly. <laughs> you're not talking to, oh, you're talking to me directly. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, you left me and hopefully um, the rest of the audience with a lot to think about. Um, how do you influence it? How do you understand it? How do you become part of it? Mm. Um, that, le that makes it less scary. And let technology be your friend, mm. not your uh, opponent. Thank you so much, Graham. Thank Pleasure. you so much for coming. Guys, that is where we leave it for today. Thank you so, so much uh, for joining us. Uh, this podcast is a collaboration between DW, Jacaranda FM, and East Coast Radio. Please catch this episode and other episodes on our YouTube channel and other platforms. Until next time, my name is Nozibele Kamgana Mayaba. Bye for now. Don't hold back. Say it loud. loud, loud.